Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Ask the Radiologist webinar series. Before we get started, I'm going to share some housekeeping items for today's webinar. Everyone on the call will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. At the end, we will open the floor for live Q&A. We encourage you to ask questions and you can submit your questions at any time using the chat box feature in the Zoom platform. If you would like to ask your question live, simply click on the raise your hand button and we will unmute you during the Q&A portion. For today's webinar on MRI and CT contrast, we are joined by Dr. Fergus. We also have your physician liaison, Travis Roseboro, on the phone. If you have any needs regarding patient education, referral forms, or other materials, Travis can stop by your office for a visit. Dr. Nate Fergus is a board-certified radiologist at Charlotte Radiology, where he is subspecialized in breast imaging and musculoskeletal radiology. Dr. Fergus completed his residency and fellowship at the University Hospital Case Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio, and is a member of several radiology societies. I'm now gonna pass it over to Dr. Fergus to begin the presentation. Thank you, Alexa, and thank you everyone for joining me today. I'm gonna to go ahead and, and delve right into this because this is a big topic um, and there's a lot to cover, um, but hopefully I can uh, squeeze it in so that we can leave some time for the Q&A session afterwards in case something doesn't make sense or you want some extra explanation. So as Alexa said, I am Nate Fergus. Just a fun fact about me to start with, um, I was formerly uh, the bat boy for the Cleveland Indians um, and so this is a little uh, picture of me. I'm on the far left there uh, just a few years ago now. But the outline to start with, um, we, I will start with uh, definition and purpose of giving CT and MRI IV contrast. I will cover some drawbacks using the IV contrast, including allergic reactions to CT contrast, um, contrast-induced nephropathy, which happens with CT contrast, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, which is a MRI contrast phenomenon, and a new topic in the literature, soft tissue gadolinium retention. And then I want to kind of go from head to toe, um, going through the, do you order the study with contrast, without contrast, or with or without? In a previous life, I did some clinical medicine. I know sometimes that can be confusing. So to start with CV or CT IV contrast, it is iodine based and it improves, it improves differentiation of biologic tissues. There are several indications to use CT contrast and those are to evaluate vessels, to better see or characterize tumors, to evaluate the function of various organs and for infection. There are some drawbacks as I've mentioned earlier. Um, the first drawback is actually it's invasive. Anytime you put an IV in someone, everyone knows that's invasive. Uh, there are allergic reactions that can happen and there is contrast-induced nephropathy. So to start with allergic reactions, they are uncommon. They're adverse events that happen in 0.2 to 0.7% of injections. They're severe in 0.04% and can be fatal in one out of every 170,000 injections. The biggest risk factor for having a reaction is having a prior reaction and your risk is increased five to six fold. Also, if, you, if a patient has a history of severe atopy, that does increase the risk. Hopefully we all know now that there is no specific link between allergic reactions to contrast, IV contrast and shellfish allergy. Uh, it's a totally different thing that people are allergic to when they're allergic to shellfish called tropomyosins if anyone's, uh, if, if anyone's interested. Um, if someone has had a reaction in the past, there are some elective pre-medication uh, regimens that I have listed there. And we can also, in the radiology suite, use an emergent pre-medication regimen uh, if we really need the study to be performed. Uh, and it, everyone should know that active infection and impaired immunity are relative contraindications to giving steroids. Contrast induced nephropathy uh, happens with CT contrast. It's acute injury following contrast administration. Know that there is a low risk for this happening with stable renal function. We like to get a serum creatinine to determine patient's risk if they're over 60, if they have kidney disease, if they've had a family history of kidney failure, if they have diabetes, hypertension, they're on other nephrotoxic meds, or if they have a paraproteinemia such as multiple myeloma. Um, know that aneuric patients 
with end stage renal disease they can get contrast, unfortunately, because their kidneys aren't working, so they're not going to get greater kidney damage. We, in order to diagnose contrast induced nephropathy, uh, the definition is an absolute increase in creatinine by, by 0 0.3. Uh, increase in creatinine by 1.5 times over their baseline and a urine output of less than or equal to 0 0.5 mill milliliters per kilogram over the past six hours. Now to switch to MRI contrast, it's gadolinium based. Gadolinium is that heavy metal that's paramagnetic and alters the signal in tissues. There are several indications which are very reminiscent of CT contrast indications with the added benefit of, of being able to see active demyelinating lesions in the neural axis. Drawbacks again are they're, they're invasive. There are adverse reactions, but they're exceedingly rare. Nephrogenic systemic fibrosis will go over and, and the new topic of organ accumulation. To start with NSF, it is a severe, potentially fatal progressive fibrosis of the skin and other organs that happens in um, patients days to months after contrast administration. Again, we, can, we like to consider creatinine levels in patients over 60 or if they have kidney disease or diabetes or hypertension. And we do like to uh, obtain a GFR within two days prior to the administration of contrast. The highest risk patients are dialysis patients and those with a low GFR, less than 30. The major clinical criteria to diagnosing NSF is patterned skin plaques, cobblestoning, severe induration or produrange skin, and co joint contractures. And then finally, um, I'd like to touch on this new topic in the literature of, of uh, retention of gadolinium. Studies have shown, as in this picture below, uh, that there can be gadolinium accumulation in brain bone and other organs. There's not, it's not yet clear if there's any clinical significance to this retention. There is a proposed disease that you can read about on my slide there. It is reported more often with people, multiple doses, pregnant women and children but the studies are ongoing. A few notes on uh, contrast in pregnancy. Uh, of course, we like to avoid most things uh, in pregnancy if we can. CT and MRI contrast both cross the placenta, but there's no evidence of teratogenesis with, with uh, either contrast. Also, when breastfeeding, know that only a small amount of contrast is excreted in the breast milk, and there has been no evidence of infant toxicity, allergy, or other reaction, but if mothers are still concerned, they can discard their breast milk for a day or two. Now we're gonna go head to toe. So I'd like to start with the brain. Um, I've tried to make this uh, really clinically evident. So uh, if, if you have some um, indications for a study, kind of guide you through what is the best way to proceed. With the brain, CT of the brain without contrast is, is how we usually start um, for most indications. And really it shows strokes and hemorrhage really well. In the upper picture, there's a left MCA distribution stroke. Know that in radiology, our right and left are, are switched. So it's on the right side of your screen, but there's that low attenuation geographic area. I don't know if you could see my mouse or not, but, but I'm pointing to it there. Um, and that is a, a stroke in a non-contrast CT. In the lower image, there's some irregular high density material in the left side of the brain. That's hemorrhage on a non-contrast CT. We can see all that very well. Now, very rarely we'll, we'll do a, a brain with and without contrast. This is mostly in patients who can't get an MRI. Um, and they have acute headache and, and they do have a history of malignancy. So you're, you're worried about malignancy in the brain. In these pictures in the, in the right side of the brain, you can see a metastatic lesion, that rounded thing over there was surrounded ede surrounding edema. Um, and that is uh, contrast enhancing. So that's why we use contrast because we can see the abnormal vessels within the tumor. When it comes to the vessels in the brain, uh, we use CTAs of the head, and that means CT um, arteriogram or angiogram, um, and that's always done with contrast when, it, when we're talking about CTs. Uh, we can look for coronary artery stenosis or occlusion. I'm, I'm sorry, I said coronary. I mean uh, intracranial artery stenosis or occlusion or intracranial uh, aneurysms. Um, this right or this picture on the on the left side of your screen shows a tiny little aneurysm in, in the right MCA. Uh, and on the left side, or 
uh, here I'm, I'm doing the radiologist thing again. Um, but on the right side of the screen, if, if you can see my cursor as, as I ascend in the internal um, carotid artery, all of a sudden there's an abrupt cutoff and you can see occlusion there. When it comes to imaging of the brain after CT, the superior imaging is a brain with and without contrast. And we use with and without so that we can, we can tell which things are enhancing. Things that do enhance aren't bright when, before you give contrast and are bright after you give contrast. And uh, this encompasses most um, indications for imaging of the brain. We can do MRI without contrast, and it does cover the most common indications uh, after CT. Uh, just most people do order with and without, uh, just because if we can't answer the whole question as radiologists uh, on a non-contrast exam, we may ask you to get a contrasted exam as well. So sometimes people just race ahead and do the with and without, but know that if a patient can't get MRI contrast or you just wanna order it without, we can um, make most diagnoses without contrast. Oh, and this picture, this is a special diffusion weighted image that shows a uh, bright stroke in the left side of the brain. When it comes to vessels within the brain, we have MRAs, uh, again, and we have new techniques now that actually we don't have to use contrast with the MRAs in the head and neck. Um, the one exception is that if the person has had a previous aneurysm that's been coiled or clipped in the brain, uh, the sequences that we use uh, make that metal, uh, well, we produce a large amount of artifact with the metal. And so we do do with contrast if they have metal in the brain. But other than, other than that, we can do without. And it's the same indications as the CTA of the brain. Just some special cases. Um, if there's facial bone fractures, we don't need contrast. So you can get a CT of the facial bones without contrast. And these pictures nicely show, um, unfortunately for this patient, a million fractures uh, indicated by all the arrows. CT is nice because we can do 3D reconstructions, as you can see on the right side of your screen, the skull. Um, and that's the lines are showing the distribution of the fractures that we can tell on a CT without contrast. If a patient has conductive hearing loss or mastoiditis, uh, we can do a CT of the temporal bones. We don't need contrast for that. This image nicely shows on the, on the left side of, of, the, of, the, of the head, which is your right side of the screen, the mastoid air cells are nicely filled with air, the black air. And on the right side, they're filled with this gray material, mucus and, and fluid. And this is mastoiditis. Now we'll move on to soft tissues of the neck. The best way to see the soft tissues of the neck is a, is a CT with contrast. Why do we need with contrast? Because there's a lot of uh, structures that are crammed into the neck and they're all smushed together. So when we, when we give contrast, it nicely differentiates, differentiates the um, different tissues. And, and you can read on the slide the different um, indications for, for such a study. The left-sided picture, um, and hopefully this is all, all these pictures are interesting to you. I know most of you aren't radiologists, but I'm a dork radiologist. So this is why I went in. So I, I think that these, these pictures, um, this patient has an enhancing peritidis on the right. And that's due to blocking the Stetson's duct. Um, in this right-sided picture, you see these rim-enhancing, low attenuation round structures on either side of the neck. Those are tonsillar abscesses, very nicely seen in a CT with contrast. Moving on to the chest, almost everything in the chest we can see on a CT without contrast. And that's really the work, workhorse of chest imaging. Uh, the most common indications are infection in lung nodules and masses. Uh, pertinent, unfortunately, to, to today um, is COVID-19 pneumonia. Um, this is a picture of our typical appearance of COVID-19 with these patchy white densities in each lung with a peripheral distribution. This non-contrast CT nicely shows that. There are special non-contrast CTs called high resolution studies, which are pretty much evaluate interstitial lung disease, COPD and bronchiectasis. High resolution just means that we look for our air trapping 
uh, with the patient doing an expert in expiration, we image them. Uh, and also we put them on the belly uh, so that we can tell the difference between atelectasis and as in this case, um, there's fibrosis in the posterior lung basis. Um, sometimes atelectasis can look like that, but when we put them on their belly, if it persists, it's not atelectasis, it's most likely fibrosis. There are special cases when we do a CT of the chest with contrast, and that's mostly cancer or, or some kind of uh, pleural disease. And, and uh, another big indication is for mediastinal lymphadenopathy. This um, example here is a CT of the chest uh, with contrast, you can see that the aorta and the pulmonary artery are, are bright because of the contrast material. And, and these lobular, um, less bright um, structures in each hilar are lymph nodes. If we didn't put the contrast in there, everything would look the same color. And so that's why we, um, it sometimes really makes it stand out to us if we give contrast. Sometimes we, we need to look at the vessels in the chest more clearly, and those are CTAs of the chest, and all those are done with contrast. And the most common is for pulmonary embolism, um, and also we can look at aortic disease. It's infrequent that we have an MRI of the chest, but we, we can do that other than cardiac, which we'll get to next, but we will do that with and without contrast for things like chest wall masses or mediastinal masses. In this example, there's a, a cystic lesion in the anterior mediastinum that turn, turned out to be a thymic cyst. When it comes to coronary arteries, uh, the best way to look at the coronary arteries via our imaging, this is uh, uh, not what our cardiologists do, they directly look at it with, with angiogram, with, and geography. Um, but what we look at are, um, we can see them most clearly on a CT of the coronary arteries with and without contrast. And um, we do the without so that we can see calcium, as you can see in this picture down here, that bright calcium within the proximal portion of the left anterior descending coronary artery. Um, and we also give the contrast as, as in this example, fills the aorta, the, the left ventricle, and also the coronary artery. So we can see areas of narrowing that are not due to calcium. If we're just looking for plaque burden, we do a CT coronary, cal coronary calcium score, which is done without contrast. And, and we just quantify the amount of calcium in the coronary arteries. Uh, continuing with the MRI of the heart, um, most indications for MRI we do with and without contrast, and that's for um, the cardiomyopathy, ischemia, or pericardial disease. Um, this example, uh, this round structure is the left ventricular wall. You can see this brightness on the inside of the lateral wall, and that's ischemia, um, subendocardial ischemia. So that's uh, with and without contrast. We can do uh, MRI of the heart without contrast, mostly for cardiac anomalies, looking at anatomy. As in, in this example, it shows that the aorta is on the wrong side of the pulmonary artery in this patient with transposition of the great vessels. Moving on to the abdomen and pelvis, the workhorse for imaging of the abdomen and pelvis is a CT with contrast. And that's for almost every uh, indication uh, that you can think of, mass, pain, weight loss, cancer. Um, lymphoma, everything. Um, this example, it's real zoomed in, so it's hard for you to tell where we are, but this is the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. Um, uh, to the left of the screen is the cecum, and there's this tubular structure coming off that's the appendix. It is dilated, and there's a rounded appendicolith within the appendix. This is an example of appendicitis. You can see the enhancing wall of the appendix and some surrounding inflammation, all uh, better appreciated with contrast. Sometimes there is an indication for a CT of the abdomen or pelvis with and without contrast, and those are mostly phasic studies. Phasic studies are, mean that we do a CT without contrast, and then we give contrast, uh, and we image at different time points, um, and, and that tells us how certain structures or tumors are taking up contrast and getting rid of it, and it helps us make the diagnosis. Certain examples that we might need that for are, are liver disease, looking for hepatocellular carcinoma or regenerative nodules, adrenal masses, um, adrenal masses, if it's lipid-rich adenoma, um, we can see the fat on a non-contrast exam. And then if it's lipid poor, then we can make the diagnosis of an adenoma depending on how the uh, mass takes up and gets rid of contrast. 
um, and another uh, is renal disease. Most of you know about the Bosniak criteria uh, for cystic renal lesions, and, and we use uh, uh, study with and without contrast to make that diagnosis. The image on the left side of your screen just shows some bilateral adrenal nodules that turned out to be lipid poor adenomas uh, diagnosed with a phasic study. We actually, we don't like to admit it, but we can make mo most diagnoses uh, on the abdomen and pelvis on a CT without contrast. If the patient can't get contrast, we can see most inflammation from that. Um, however, know that it is difficult to differentiate the different soft tissues without using contrast. Um, we also use it to look for calcium or fat. Uh, why would we look for calcium? Well, kidney stones, gallstones, atherosclerosis, uh, those are some reasons. Uh, we also can look for fat, as in what I already described, the lipid-rich ad adrenal adenoma, or to diagnose hepatosteatosis, fatty liver disease. That, those are best seen on a, uh, a non-contrast CT. When it comes to MRI, um, imaging of the abdomen and pelvis, uh, is usually done for if there's some CT finding that we need more evaluation or for cancer staging. Um, this example on the right side of your screen shows a hepatocellular carcinoma. It's a rim enhancing um, lesion in the right hepatic lobe. Vascular imaging in the chest, abdomen, and pelvis is done with the CTA, which is done with contrast, just like the brain and neck. Um, and, and we can look for any kind of vascular abnormality, whether it be aortic disease, um, vascular injury, an aneurysm somewhere, um, atherosclerotic disease, such as in peripheral arterial disease, evaluation of grafts, um, evaluation of the renal arteries, uh, given which uh, presents as malignant hypertension or GI hemorrhage. We can also do MRA of the abdomen and pelvis, and these are usually done with and without contrast. Um, some indications would be for renal artery stenosis or, or peripheral artery disease. Finally, this is my uh, bread and butter, our MSK and spide imaging. These are my subspecialties. Um, and when it comes to extremities and joints, a non-contrast MRI is central to MSK imaging. You just need to specify the bone or the joint. Well, we do this for, for any kind of trauma, looking at osteoarthritis or osteochondral defects or infection. We do do with and without contrast MRIs for in, in the MSK world for special cases, such as looking at inflammatory arthropathies, we can nicely see enhancing synovitis. Uh, infection, whether it be osteomyelitis, abscesses, or fasciitis, myositis, are, are really good with, with and without contrast. Um, in the neuro, neuro world, we, we can look for myopathy with and without contrast, and malignancy is always, if, if possible, image with and without contrast. This example on the right side of your screen is a synovial sarcoma in a young patient behind the knee. Um, it shows a predominantly rim-enhancing cystic lesion with an enhancing soft tissue component. CT without contrast is, is the mainstay of imaging in, a, in the setting of acute trauma, such as in fractures or dislocation or surgical hardware evaluation, um, or sometimes rarely will uh, ask for it just for further evaluation of um, a lesion in the bone, looking at the osseous, uh, at the um, internal matrix. These examples are cases I've had recently on the right. Um, there's some cement uh, that's within uh, that's been placed in severely comminuted distal tibial and fibular fractures. This is in the setting of trauma, obviously. And on the, on the right side of the screen, you can see screws that are passing through the, the calcaneus and talus. And we, we look for any complication of hardware on CT. A CT with contrast, if the patient can't get an MRI or, or if, uh, if, if time is an issue, we can do a CT with contrast to look for abscesses, fasciitis, or myonecrosis. This example shows this. Uh, this is a recent case I read, um, subcutaneous um, rim-enhancing abscess anterior to the distal femur. I do, even though this is not, this is a talk about IV contrast, I will briefly talk about um, MRI and CT arthrograms. We do MRI arthrograms usually for labra, 
either the glenoid labrum in the shoulder or the acetabular labrum in the, in the uh, hip it, um, when we fill the contrast or fill the joint with contrast material it nicely separates structures and fills in defects so we can see it real nicely. Um, also, we do CT arthrograms uh, for any joint when MRI can't be done. CTs of the joints without filling it with contrast are pretty limited, but if you put contrast in the joint, we can see most structures. This example of the wrist is an MRI arthrogram in, in the bottom, um, and it is showing a defect in the scaphalunate ligament and a defect, a central defect in the TFCC. A continuation of MSK is, is in this is the spine, and, and most of the spine is reminiscent of MSK imaging. Um, MRI without contrast, like MSK, is the workhorse um, for most indications, pain, radiculopathy, or trauma. We nicely see um, disc disease or ligamentous disruption on a non-contrast exam. There are special cases when we use with and without contrast, um, and that is for infection, looking for discitis, osteomyelitis, or epidural abscesses, maybe facet septic arthritis, or malignancy. Also, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, demyelinating disease uh, is best evaluated with and without contrast. Um, know that we can see demyelinating lesions without contrast, but we uh, can only tell if they're active or not when we see if they're enhancing. And that means that we have to give contrast. Trauma, just like MSK, or acute trauma is best evaluated with CT um, or again, like MSK, looking for uh, any problems with surgical hardware. On the left side of your screen, you, you can see a type two odontoid fracture in the cervical spine, that nice lucent line. Um, on this non-contrast exam. And on the right side of your screen, there's this lucency surrounding bilateral particular screws in the lower lumbar spine, indi indicative of loosening. Uh, infection in the spine, when an MRI can't be done, we can do a CT with contrast um, to look any, for any kind of infection. In this example above, you can um, you might have to take my word for it, but there's lobular uh, enhancing tissues surrounding the cord in the cervical spine. That's epidural phlegmon. There are also rim enhancing collections in the pre vertebral space um, that are consistent with abscesses. And so this is small print, but this is just a summary over everything that we've gone. And if, if you get a copy of this, this is maybe a nice thing to post in your, uh, without my picture, of course, a uh, nice thing to uh, post in the office um, as a summary. And uh, this, this picture, again, I was in the bad boy. This is me next to David Justice and some of my very good buddies. All right, thank you very much. Amazing presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Fergus, for taking the time to share this informative information with us. So I know we just have about a couple of minutes before we reach the top of the hour. So if you have any questions, again, to enter the questions, you can use the chat box feature in the Zoom platform. Or if you would like to ask your question live on the webinar, simply click on raise hand and I will go ahead and unmute you so that you can ask your question. So we'll go ahead and give it a minute to see if anyone um, has any questions. Okay, so I do have a, a question asking, will we get a copy of the slides? And the answer is yes. Um, after the presentation, you will get a recording of this webinar as well as a PDF copy of the slide deck that uh, Dr. Fergus reviewed today. Hey doc, this is Travis. Um, quick question. Uh, I know in your daily activity, um, you probably run on um, some, some hot buttons where people order the wrong things. Um, what, what, what are the top maybe two or three that come in incorrect uh, when you're trying to look for an image? That is actually a great question. I, I think, you know, now, full disclosure, I'm a musculoskeletal imager. So that's mostly where my uh, where, where my day-to-day -day comes in. Um, I don't think that there are a whole lot of mistakes, um, except that to know that most things in musculoskeletal imaging that are not uh, tumor or infection, we don't need contrast. Um, sometimes I, I think that patients will needlessly get contrast um, for, for, uh, for anything, for any trauma or pain. Um, Usually, uh, if there's a tumor or, or some kind of cancer, the, the 
referring physicians know about it. And in those cases, we would do with or without contrast. But I think that that is probably the biggest thing that I see in my day to day. Thank you. Um, and I know we have Bob on. Um, Bob, could you shed some light on the difference between the cost with and without? Because um, I know that a lot of providers just throw that Hail Mary and just put both. But what cost um, impact would that have if you ordered it and didn't need it? I would say roughly um, a with and without average, you know, average reimbursement or average charge for that for the typical patient is going to be roughly about also, especially in MRI, you're doing twice the imaging. So again, you know, when you order a with and without contrast first and then injecting and then doing the same series, you know, or a portion of the exam over again. Um, but again, I don't, I think it's important that, we, you know, is the, if the contrast matches the diagnosis is what's more important than the cost. I think, you know, doing it without scan that definitely needs a with contrast would be, um, wouldn't give you the information you needed. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Dr. Fergus, so I know we're just a little bit over uh, one o'clock now. We do have one final question that came in, so hoping that you could respond uh, to this before we wrap up today's call. So the question is, which is superior in a stroke workup, CTA versus MRA, head and neck? When I talk to my uh, neuro colleagues before this, they, they do prefer the CTA. It's just better definition of the, of the vessels. That being said, um, either is good. Now we keep making better uh, progress with our MRI, MRA sequences without contrast, but I would say CTA. Thank you. And then just one more final question that just came in. Are non-contrast CTs preferred over uh, ultrasound for a kidney stone in an urgent care setting? Um, you can see more stones, smaller stones, uh, and more stones uh, with CT. Um, so I, that's a tough question. I think either is fine. Either, either shows most stones and either shows hydronephrosis. Um, the only issue is the, when you look uh, more distally at the ureters, a lot of times the bowel gas, any kind of air will obscure your ultrasound pictures. Um, so if you're worried about a ureteral stone, it's much better getting the CT um, because you just, a lot of times you just won't see anything distal to the, to the kidneys at all. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Fergus, for your response. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today on this important topic. And thank you to everyone who attended and listened into the webinar. As I mentioned, you will receive a follow-up email with a recording of this webinar with a copy of the slide. So thank you to all so much for joining us today. I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.